author, and artist, and really anyone who is a creative person who wants to get their writing or artwork out to people and also to hopefully a profit. I think everybody's interested in that as well when they want to do art endeavors to some degree. So allow me to introduce everybody and they're going to start discussing. Um, we will be sure to open up questions in your about 20 minutes to go. And hope everybody enjoys. Starting over here, we have Keith Cross. Keith Cross is a tattoo artist, painter, illustrator, and graphic novelist. He is the author and illustrator of the Day Black series, and his diverse cast of individuals who have met in the tattoo parlor are a big part of why he began the Day Black series. And next, we have Tobias Buckle. He is a New York Times bestselling writer born in the Caribbean. He grew up in Granada and spent time in the British and U.S. Virgin Islands, an upbringing which influenced as much as his work. The Xeno Wealth series, along with other standalone novels and over 60 stories, have been translated into 18 different languages. He was nominated for awards at Hugo, Nebula, Prometheus, and the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Science Fiction Author. And next we have Rosanna Emery. Rosanna is the author of Winter Tide, the first book in the In and Out Legacy series. Deep Roots is the second book in the series and was released this month. She co writes for Tor.com's Lovecraft Green Read and writes short stories about religion and aliens and psycholinguistics. I really want to know more about. <coughs> last, but certainly not least, we have Edward Lorne. Edward Lorne is a reader, writer, and YouTube content creator who has worked in every facet of the publishing industry, from editing to cover design, writing to criticism, who has 15 years. He has been writing professionally since 2011 and his most recent novel, Betty of Boys, is due out August 18th. Now, I'm sure you all have to hear from our authors and not from me any longer, so. Um, I would like to ask the journal question. Um, when, when you think about social media, what is it you see as its most effective use for you as a creative person? For me, it, especially as an indie author, it is my customer service go-to. Um, if I have any questions about which of my books should somebody read first, um, which of my books is good for maybe certain age groups, uh, is there, you know, that's what I, what I think of when I think of social media for an author is letting you connect with the people that you normally wouldn't connect with. Um, especially, you know, let's say 10 years ago, it wouldn't have been um, as prevalent or as easy to connect with people. Um, I, I use it specifically for customer service, whether it be, um, and of course interacting fan interaction, but um, if there's something wrong with one of my books, let's say like the format is broken or something like this, it's the easiest way for them to contact me. Um, whether it be DMs or, I, now I don't, what I don't use it for is promotion. Um, when I use social media, I use social media um, as uh, just an everyday person. I post my likes, dislikes, things like that. But when it comes to how I interact with people on a day-to-day -day basis, it's usually about the books themselves and if I can help them, point them in the right direction, or let them contact me and maybe build more of a relationship than just a, a, a fan and author relationship. Um, you can build, it's the best way to keep a readership. Getting a reader isn't hard, keeping a reader is a more difficult aspect of it. It's a long time between books for most of us. Um, it's, for me, a good way both to try and stay um, in people's minds as a person who writes the sort of things that I write, and it's also, for me, a good way to keep myself motivated to hear from fans and people who are interested in the sort of thing that I do. Um, I, I'm someone who likes fast, regular feedback, which is sort of an awkward thing for an author, um, and it means that I get at least a little bit of that. Um, when I first started working on Wintertide, which is the sequel to a novel that, that I've had up on Tor.com, and I realized it was going to be probably a couple of years that the novel that everyone had said, hey, we'd like to see a book about this and actually having a book. Um, that's why I ended up starting Lovecraft Reviews, so that in the intervening two years, people would not forget that I was a person who um, wrote about Lovecraft and requested that. And it also gave me an excuse to um, do some of my 
research in a place where I would have been? Um, I'm an extrovert, so I just like uh, you know chatting with people everywhere. And the enjoyable thing about social media for me is not that I set out to particularly say, hey, I'm going to monetize this medium and get lots of people to follow me on it and sell them my books. I signed up for uh, Twitter because a bunch of people I really enjoyed uh, BSing with on Twitter, and we just started slinging and stuff back and forth. Um, I have a little bit of a reputation for having a large social media profile, but it's not that large, and it's just that I'm available there, and I like to chat with people there. I find it really useful in terms of when I do the uh, occasional uh, sort of crowdfunding project that's a away from the sort of uh, traditional publishing New York project that I, I do. Um, it's nice to have a kind of a base full launch problem that usually serves me really well to drop the word on Twitter that I'm, you know, launching a new project and here's where you can find it. But uh, to be honest, uh, I, I, I think it's, um, you know, uh, it, it's a place where I go to sort of be genuine and be myself, hang out, and then learn from other people's perspectives and, and follow people I wouldn't normally have the ability to access in real life and see what they're talking about, thinking, and doing. Um, and so for me, it's just a, a place to sort of exchange ideas and, and the, the, the sort of heavy side promotion of it is sort of incidental, to be honest. Okay, yeah, well, my life's about it. I'm an introvert. So uh, I find it really awkward <coughs> usually to, uh, to talk about myself or to really promote myself around others. It's almost kind of embarrassing to talk about myself. Like, yeah, I got to do what it's great. But on social media, and as you all know, people on social media a lot of times say stuff that they wouldn't want to say in front of someone. <laughs> you get a lot more courage and you get a lot more open to say more things when you're behind that keyboard. So on a positive note, as far as uh, my book goes, that's been an asset for me because I've been able to really say things that I, I just wouldn't say to somebody because I'm not really, you know, but I'm starting to get better at that because with events like this, I kind of have to do that anyway. But the uh, screen point of that, and for me to get my book published with social media and um, posting my artwork every day and those likes, you know, sometimes the likes are really superficial when people seek them out so heavily, but they're also very, uh, motivational for an artist and for a writer. Yeah. And when you give an immediate gratification to somebody likes what you're doing, which ultimately turns into you really doing the book for the fans, not so much for yourself. And it starts out being for you, but when you see all these people that I love it, it turns into it's not really for me anymore. It turns out to be for them. And that's definitely for social media for me. That's how it really impacted everything. Yeah. I can just say that there has been a, a learning curve because I believe you know, it's one of those things it seems like that people realize uh, that this was sort of suddenly going to be something that is very much um, a viable way of finding readers, talking to people, which at the same time, as you were saying, um, sometimes people will say things on social media that would never say in front of other people, which I believe, you know, it's the, um, it's what happens when you get your looking at a screen and not looking for the face. So, um, could y'all speak to anything you, you've learned from personally from having you social media? Um, I would. It's I've learned how to read people um, without inflection. It's really hard to take what a person says on social media because you don't have other. Way, you know, there's no sarcasm font. You know, um, you, so you have to learn to. That's that was my main thing. Is I had to learn how to read people that would say something that maybe is sarcastic, maybe isn't, and a lot of that. Uh, you, that's what emojis are for. Um, so that, you know, I had to learn, um, and not every emoji is the same on every device. So some emoji will look one way. Like one one smile could be a kissy face on another one. So you, you have to be careful in that aspect also. But um, I think that's one of the things that was a, a huge learning curve for me. People would joke with me, and I, and I would take them seriously. I was like, whoa, chill out. <laughs> oh, oh, you were kidding. Well, I wish we had a sar sac you know, sarcasm fun. Um, and I, I, th I think that's the, the, biggest pro the biggest problem for me was, was learning how to take people. I would have to get awful thing and go back to the <laughs> 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 in the moment, and when it's not rewarding in the moment, it's, you know, Twitter is a very 
anxiety-producing platform for your player. You might miss something that's in the next scroll down and you can <laughs> see what happens. There's some, some huge thing has blown up that everyone's upset about it, and you want to see what happens in the huge count down. And then you can put it away and go back to doing the actual important author stuff that is behind the social media. So yeah, that speaks to like the dark side of social media so to speak, um, which is really interesting. There, there are two aspects of it that I think are, are something that, that are really interesting to have forward and navigate. One is that, which is continuous partial interruption, right? Um, and, and in this day and age, with uh, notifications, email, dinging you, whatever it comes in, all that stuff, um, you have to be very careful about managing that. Um, I run into a lot of people who are really bad at managing that. And, uh, I'm ADD, so I've been managing continuous partial interruption since I was uh, four or five years old, so everyone else welcome to my world. <laughs> um, and same year, same year. so you have to uh, you have to kind of uh, build yourself some very, from I find, uh, some very specific sort of guidelines about how to use this uh, tool, uh, because like many other tools, it can be you know, useful as a butter knife, but you can also stab people with it. Um, and Twitter is, is, is interesting in one that it, 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 it can eat up a tremendous amount of your time because it's uh, sort of like, you know, uh, you know, lazy potato chip. <laughs> they can't read just one um, because it continuously uh, refreshes, right? And if you pull down and refresh, uh, you're immediately getting another tweet, another tweet, another tweet. And, and there's always just another little hit um, a step away. So it can become really addictive. And, uh, that has to be managed if you want to get the actual writing done. <laughs> um, and so I'm, uh, you know, actually, I actually have the uh, um, iOS beta installed. <coughs> and has uh, uh, these uh, limitations on it. It shows you how much uh, social media you use versus <laughs> other things you use, all in a whole nice graph form. It'll be coming out this fall uh, for your phone. But it's uh, very interesting to actually see how many times you pick up and look at your phone. You know, the other day it was like, you know, hey, you picked up and looked at your phone 120 times during the day. It's just like, what the hell, right? <laughs> like, really, that many times? That's a uh, yeah. Yeah. When I saw the title of this, I, I don't know how many people have ever played Pine Noir, but I social media is your friend. <laughs> <laughs> but then the other aspect is that one, um, you have this really unique thing. It used to be where if you were a columnist, you, you would post a column, everyone would read it, and some of the responses would come back to you, but not that many. So you had a kind of one-to-many relationship. Um, and now with Twitter, you have that where you can broadcast to a lot of people. You can get retweets and likes that propel it into other people's feeds, and something you can write can have this velocity. But also, any of those people can respond right back to you. And so it's really hard for a lot of people because uh, we're just learning how to deal with this for the first time in content creation history, is the fact that like you can post something and get thousands of responses back from someone if you happen to trigger a nerve or it goes viral. Um, and managing that requires you to have to use a whole new set of tools as a creator that uh, we're just now starting to get used to, unless you were previously sort of at the very, very top of the game. There's some authors or uh, artists who would get hundreds of thousands of letters every day, but then at that point, they would be rich enough to have, if you were getting that kind of feedback, people who could filter that flood for you. <coughs> None of us have that. I don't have a staff that filters horrible Twitter replies. If I decide <laughs> to post something that goes viral, I just suddenly, you know, every time I pick this up, I tweeted something, just a thought earlier in the day about something. If I pick up my Twitter feed and look at it and it says, 150 replies, I always just feel this sort of stinker closing moment of, oh shit, what happened? <laughs> um, you can't concentrate on your writing. Right, you know, you, 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 and, and, you have, and, and dealing with that is, is kind of, I think, the, the negative side of it. Yeah. yeah okay, well, um, for me personally, I had to definitely um, learn about the rules of engagement when dealing with people on social media uh, because I definitely started uh, posting images of my book in a very early stage and just from my normal Facebook friends before I was even doing this professionally. When they started to get, when they started to pick up the steam, you know, people were going with me like on the journey, you know, they were getting issues, they were, but the thing the thing happens where people start to feel invested and they feel the need to tell you their, it's like you're very accessible to these people, so they have an urge or, or a need or a want to tell you how, you, how they think it should go, 
I even had a guy that sent me a copy back <coughs> with notes in it that he made notes of every page of what he thought was, was bad, we thought was good. I was like, man, this is, but you can't listen to it, you know what I'm saying? And you can't listen to any of it. And you kind of have to alienate people. And, um, and I still am getting used to that, you know what I'm saying? Because it's still people that have supported me. But I guess because, I guess because of social media, and I built a social media relationship with them before this happened, I feel it's, it's weird. I feel obligated to listen to them, but I know I can't let their opinion change because everybody has their opinion. Everybody's going to hate what you do. Everybody's going to love it. You're never going to get a unanimous anything on, on social media. So it's not like uh, so for me, um, that would be the curve. I guess, yeah. At the end of the day, and it's your work. I Basically, mean, yeah. If, if, yeah. if somebody has a problem with it, you have a problem with it. But you know, at the end of the day, you you have to be proud of it. If you're not happy with right. it, right? And, and the hard part is to not saying, "Hey, shut up." <laughs> the hardest part is to try to be diplomatic without yeah. losing the reader, because now you 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 can talk to these people face to face, not face to face, but you can really have conversations with these people. I mean, I guess I could not engage with them, but I think the fact that I have been, people have seen my story and my journey has been yeah. one of the things that has like, went to my success. You know? yeah. 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 Well, the times where I've gotten useful feedback are actually some of the most rewarding social media interactions I've had. So it, it distracts me from writing, but sometimes I use it to get over. Um, so there was this one point where I was writing my latest book where I decided to rip myself into a corner and I, I had to get them out of this, what do I do? And I, I posted on social media, I said, okay, you're, you're in the call with this person and you need to get through New York ads in the middle of the day, what do you do? And I got all sorts of fun replies and a couple of things that I actually kind of adapted into the way I got out of the scene. And then it was, it, it was fun to you know, I, the people who did that into the acknowledgments, and then here I am a year later, and one of them gets back to me and says, you remember? I can't believe you remember. And it was just, a, it was a nice little bit of back and forth with readers that you were doing again with that sort of immediacy. I wanted to touch on something that was brought up that I was talking about the, uh, the time, how it, cut, it cutting into the writing time. Um, I think you talked about it also. Um, I, when I'm writing, or I have a set schedule every day I go out and I write and that's all I do. I turn off notifications, I turn off my internet, I turn off everything. Um, and that's the only thing I'm doing during that time is writing. So I'm, I guess, an odd man out here is I don't have a problem not using social media during that time because I have a set time that I can use social media and a set time when I'm writing and those, never the twain show me that kind of thing. So. Just, uh, Totally subjectively, but yeah, a lot of a lot of my writers who find success in balancing them end up having to turn everything off like that. Yeah, if I, I don't, have to use it when I do it half the time. I have to have music. It's not I just lose all the time. Nothing will get done with me if I don't turn it off. If I don't turn it off, then nothing will get done. So I, I have to I have to force myself to turn everything off. Yeah. Yeah, I remember the most interesting thing I ever heard Don Don the Francis say was he had a laptop and he actually would stick. I believe it was gum and blue inside the uh, ballot where the Wi-Fi would go or the internet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that way it'll stop any of you know, him getting on the internet. I have this existential dread of taking my laptop off because I use Dropbox to sync everything up. Oh, right. Right. Because I'm just, I, I've had a couple of hard drive crashes. And so I'm like, if I don't see that little spinning Dropbox icon, I just don't feel like I'm having safe writing. <laughs> see, I do all my all my roughs are done um, uh, written, so hand handwritten, so I don't have that problem. So, but I can see how that would be nerve wracking. Man, I, I can't imagine like when I'm finally typing it up. If I if it doesn't sync, mine is one like one note. I think it is. It's Microsoft version of Dropbox. Yeah. Um, and if, if if I don't see that little swirly thing, I, I feel you. I, this is, I'm the same way. Like all this work. If I, well, I have it backed up on hard copy, but. I can't, I can't imagine losing a whole big chunk of something. That's what, one of the reasons why all my gloves are, are handwritten. A question I do want to ask um, all of you, and it touched, it touched a little bit on it. Um, in the past, you know, obviously a lot of writers have talked about um, what you do and don't do when it comes to critical reviews. You know, there's people who don't read them, and there's people who read them because their feelings hurt, and it's obviously an issue. We now live in a time where 
their thing called reader reviews, and they're in fact more, you know, there's a lot more of them than ever. And what I was wondering is, do y'all pay attention to things like Amazon reviews or good read reviews, and how, if you do so, how do you how do you engage it? Is it a positive or is it a negative relationship? Uh, well, for me, I read everything because it's not so much out there now that it's, like, I can't find it. Like, it's like so much, like it's enough, right? I pretty much find it for my right now. But um, I just realized that we live in an age where, like I said before, everybody has, everybody you think is gonna hate it. Like, just to say, you would think your favorite movie, like, I don't know, Indiana Jones, you think that's the perfect movie, but today, you, if it came out today, they would be like, oh, that movie sucks, or, oh, this was, they would pick the part where back in the day you just knew that was a flawless movie, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> when you think about that, and I keep that in mind when I'm reading reviews, if I read something that somebody said they didn't like it, I'm like, okay, well, you know, like everybody's not gonna like it. I mean, that's just the world. Or everybody, it's always been like that, but not everybody's the same. So yeah. I, think, I, I think that's just to make the difference. So once you realize that, and that's really, really part of liberating you, so it's really understanding, you know, everybody's not gonna like it. I wanna touch on something on that topic uh, real quick. One of the best pieces of advice I first got when I first started this career was if you ever get a negative review and it hurts your feelings, you need to go over to Amazon or Goodreads or wherever, you need to find your favorite book and you need to go read the one star reviews of that book. And that way you know that nothing is going to be for everyone. And if people find something wrong with your favorite, the, the book that you think is the best thing on the face of the planet, then of course they're going to find something wrong with yours. So they never ever take it personally. I just want to throw it out there. Yeah, I try to, I read reviews when I'm feeling emotionally resilient, the good ones are working, the bad ones. And I always computer review stuff like Goodreads and Amazon, I think, and for how many I have, because it actually, especially on Amazon, it makes a difference. If you see a book you like and it is kind of getting up there towards 50 reviews, but it's not there yet. Do the review because that makes a huge difference in the promotions they do, um, the willingness to do giveaways, the just how visible it is on the site. Um, and a couple of times I've gone, okay, I'm getting close, and I let people know on social media. And um, last time I did a conference with the person who did the review. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, do, how, how, do, how do I deal with and engage with uh, reviews? There, um, there are enough of them out there, I, I can't follow all, I don't follow all of them. Um, I read somewhere that uh, the human mind engages with a negative uh, critical point, um, sometimes more emotional intensity than a, uh, a positive social note. So um, you always have to pay attention to that. The ratio, you know, you, you can get like, uh, you know, eight great positive reviews and one negative, and you basically feel as if the whole project is about to be washed. Uh, so you have to be really careful about how you let that affect you. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to, I have a friend who uh, is an expert Python programmer, and I, I, I wanted him to grab Goodreads API, create a little script that would just uh, pull out like the, the five star reviews, and, uh, Put them in like a little, uh, you know, go on little mini computers like a Raspberry Pi, slap them on the back of the monitor, just put it in my office, and so I just get a little, you know, a little five-star review when I went down there to start my day off with. Um, I thought that would be a great idea because, uh, uh, you know, uh, as if I need enough ego stroking. But um, I just thought that'd be a terrific way to kind of have a more positive relationship with reviews because of the way your brain naturally works. Um, that being said, some of the some of the one star reviews are my favorite uh, because you get a real sense for whether you wanted that reader or not. <laughs> um, quite often, there uh, that there was a there was a, a charity event I did where I recorded myself reading one of my one star reviews, um, and some of them were just really tremendously fun because you get the sense of like you know that person should never even have gone home with my book. It should have been quite clear by the cover and the back matter material that they weren't going to enjoy it. Um, and my editor and I had a running bet on one uh, one star reviewer. He used to leave a one star review for every single one of my Zenoball books. All four of them. He hated all four of them. 
So he bought the first one, he ate it, and gave it one star. Bought the second one, he ate it, and gave it one star. And by the third one, my editor was like, you'd think he'd kind of pick up on the fact that he doesn't enjoy reading you. And I was, you know, I was like, man, I would love to have just thousands and thousands of people like him. Buy the book, hate it all he wants. <laughs>
you know, escaping Facebook, and we're going over to Twitter and Instagram, but I'm not noticing the age difference. So I don't know about So the dilemma with Facebook is that um, if you have a personal page, what you broadcast <coughs> will go out to more or less your, all your followers, oh, yeah. um, depending on, on what the algorithm decides at Facebook. But you're capped at 5,000 people on personal account, right? So if you have more than 5,000 uh, potential followers, you then have to you have to use a Facebook page. Facebook page has an unlimited number of followers, which you can use to advertise to people. For Facebook page, you have to pay Facebook to then get the message to all your followers. So it's kind of like a whole lot of BS. If you if you have built a following of 20,000 people through a Facebook page, Facebook then says, I want you know five dollars, ten dollars per post, or more in some cases. For you, for that message to get to all 20,000 people. And they literally hold it hostage. They literally hold your fans hostage. Yeah. Right? So. Because it doesn't do it. Huh? Do you have a personal? Do you have a personal? Or a Facebook page. <coughs> if you look at your Facebook page, it will say this this post has reached. Yeah, but it doesn't require. I mean, it's a. No, 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 it doesn't. It doesn't you can like throw it in your face. You can be scrolling through posting or doing your own yeah. stuff. And it'll throw one and say, look, you are <laughs> this much. To reach these certain yeah. 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 what do you get? You want to boost your page. Yeah. yeah. No, I get the thing about boosting, but it No, no, it doesn't go out to all your fans. It doesn't. Really? It doesn't. You're not reaching all your fans. Unless all of your fans have notifications on them. Yeah. You okay. have to get them to go in and click notifications. And who wants to bug that? Yeah, that's why people are bouncing. Because they're holding your. Yeah, so if you boost it, then you're reaching all the people who are following you. If you don't boost it, it doesn't. They yeah, I've got those for two years, but I'll set a Facebook page now. I don't set it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have a Facebook. Um, I don't even have a personal Facebook. So with Twitter, you, uh, with Twitter, you get all the all the fans that you gain. The message goes out to most of them until about six months ago. Um, the algorithm changed. Um, so it depends on how what, what's featured in their latest uh, uh, area, and uh, they're beginning to become um, and not uh, sync. The timeline's no longer um, in, in timeline sync. So even uh, with Twitter yeah. now, I'm noticing that write, writers are having to do things like, um, and even when I, I post a, a Facebook or not Facebook, but a blog post to it, um, people are often doing the morning, um, afternoon, evening uh, post in order to sort of like make sure everyone has seen it. Because the number of times I've done something like, oh. I, I guarantee you that when I go home after having done this event, someone on Twitter is going to say, like, holy crap, you were in Birmingham? And I'll be yeah. like, yeah, I posted it on Twitter multiple times. They'll say, I didn't see it. And so, like, you know, uh, this is one reason why I'm talking about social media, actually. I've put a lot of uh, work into uh, boosting my own personal newsletter, because at least with email, I know it's getting to their inbox. So you know, I don't it's not going to be spam. Twitter no longer, so when you read Twitter, it's, um, chronological anymore. it's no longer chronological. Instagram, the tweets you see. Instagram the same way. Not yeah, it's anymore. the most popular. It was the, um, so what it does is it uses an algorithm that shows you what it thinks the most popular tweet might be that you might be interested in from all your friends. Yeah. You can reset that. Or you can reset that. Or you can right. go and use tweet tweet. I, I use tweet yeah. 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 To see what you see. see. But yeah, if, if anyone's accessing it through the web interface, and unless they go to their personal setting and change it to the uh, timeline by when when, it, when those tweets posted, they're seeing whatever Twitter thinks they might most be interested in. So I think it's weird because we're all a bunch of old fogies and we don't have Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have Instagram. I just I, I, I choose to use it differently than you know actually posting pictures. I just saw some trend in that direction. And when the author wrote that today, I thought, well, that's very interesting. I haven't noticed the that. age trend, um, I, I, so I, I, don't, I can't really speak on that. I haven't noticed yeah. the, the age. I don't know if it's age, but I, I do think it's just sort of the ability to reach. Going to Snapchat. Yeah, that's that. Mm -hmm. I don't have Snapchat either, but yes, I know that's popular with the kids as they say. But Facebook was for kids, like, you know, years ago. Years ago. Yeah, yeah, my daughter was their like, mom and their parents started following them on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they ran to Instagram, and even my mom started following us. <laughs> yeah, you can't post what you really want to post because your mom right. <laughs> yeah, so question is, uh, how each of you choose to be a platform? Is what you enjoy here is the one thing that you're interested in? Mine is enjoyment. I mean, that's, I'm on Twitter because my favorite people are on Twitter, uh, Stephen King and Joe Hill. 
uh, Pat Nozzle, uh, that kind of thing. Um, I literally follow these people just to find out what new is coming from them, and you know, hopefully they're entertaining. Um, and then there's just some regular, regular people that I find entertaining. That he, they'll, uh, Twitter will say, hey, look at this person. This person has the same likes as you. Check them out. And I, I do that. Um, and usually it's right. Um, I, it's shocking, but if I go over to Facebook, uh, Facebook gives me, hey, you know this guy from you know kindergarten? <coughs> or, you know, hey, you want to connect with this chick you dated, you know, 1997? It's like, no, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> but um, and Instagram, I like to take pictures. <laughs> that's it. So I'm on Instagram uh, and Twitter. That's all I'm on. Well, YouTube, but that's a completely different type of social media. So I'm another introvert, and all advice for marketing and outreach and networking is all aimed at extroverts. And I figured out eventually that I could either feel guilty for not doing that thing, or I could find ways that work for me and don't drive me up the tree. So I do the stuff that's fun for me, that works with the way that I actually communicate, and not the ways that I wish or other people wish I communicated. Um, I don't do Instagram, not because I'm in my 40s, but because I am not particularly a visual thinker. I work. If I if I pictured, I would be a picture. I work. I'm an author. So I like that. Yeah. And I so I have Twitter, and then I really like um, blogging stuff. Comes really naturally to me. I like writing things a little longer than a tweet haiku, but I have a short attention span. So 750 word essays are a thing that works really well for me. And having a uh, regular comment comes out on someone else's site, so someone else is handling the moderation of comments. That, that's been that I like. Uh, for me, uh, being a visual artist first, I lean more towards Instagram um, because I like to post sketches before it's finished, uh, before you see the process. Um, and then I, I noticed uh, with Facebook, I would post something. And like all day, I'll get no likes. With Instagram, I'll get likes, likes, likes. And I was like, what's going on? Like, and that's what you talk about the algorithms. Like, nobody will be seeing it. So that's another reason I just really don't even post anything on Facebook unless it's like family related or like my artwork and my story. Usually, you go to Instagram and get a quick response. And it's just easier, you know? I got a question for you. Um, in the age of a meme, how do you feel about, you're, you're a visual artist, how do you feel about? Um, your pictures being taken and used, you know, or give it, or shared without um, attribution, you know, without that. Yeah, that happens. Um, do you, do you <coughs> watermark your stuff? No. No. No, okay. because people will take that off. No, no, that, I, I watermark it before and people will take it off. Yeah. Um, How do you deal with that? Because I just like to think I have a, my style is pretty unique, cool. and I don't think it's, I think it's pretty uh, easily recognizable and. It's not like it's a one-off thing. It's not like it's not copyrighted. You know, it's, it's out there. It's published. So I'm not really worried about somebody stealing it because it's there. You know, so you have an approach. Yeah. Approach like, like, like seeing somebody, you know, putting your stuff up there. I, I'm just, I'm curious. No, I've never seen that, but I have had people That's take. Your art. I imagine you might have to do that. I mean, well, I've had people uh, reproduce paintings that I've done, but they'll tell me and they'll give me credit. You know, what I'm saying which doesn't bother me. I really don't. Because usually they aren't really that good. Right. So I'm, really, I'm not really threatened by it. You know what I'm saying? People that are really good don't really they do their own thing. Right? Exactly. You know okay. what I'm saying? So anybody that's really hacking you or knocking you off, it's not really going to be a threat to you if you really come with it in your own personal style. If you're really, really good at this thing, you know? So, um, but yeah, I think it's great. I've had people paint pictures off of my, like, from scenes from my book, you know, and post them on the page. I think it's all great, you know? As long as they're not trying to make money off of it. Yeah. Like, um, I did have a problem with a guy that I did a book with. I did a uh, pinup for one of his characters, just as a friend. Like, I just did a book of pinup for him, and he was selling prints at conventions, you know what I'm saying? Which I thought was a little strange. You know what I'm yeah. saying? That's a little funny. Well, he stopped doing that after a friend. That's a little messed up, because I just did this promo to yeah. go on your book yeah. as a country, you know, and he was selling it, you know, so. Uh, wow. They're all those little gray lines you kind of got. Yeah. Uh, well, to address your, your question, I, I run a business online and I do a lot of Facebook, a lot of Twitter, and a lot of Instagram. And I've had people take pictures that I've taken and put on my website yeah. and use for their own purpose at the same kind of business, yeah. you know, which is really annoying. Yeah. 
um, or can like take my or take the gist of my post or something that I would type up, hey, this day history or whatever, claim my business, and I would see that, that same almost the same verbiage on their posts, advertising for their business, and it's extremely annoying. Well, I, I bet it, it's it's like it's like an acceptable form of plagiarism. It is. Right? It really is. Really because is. people will go, people will share photos all over the place, right. and it's like nobody. Either there's no explanation and you don't know who the artist is, and or it's people just are not. And don't use it for your yeah. business that's yeah. directly competing with my business. It's, it's, I, um. I, can't, I couldn't imagine being a visual artist. I mean, if somebody steals my words, I have a case, you know, but if somebody uses my, my image as a meme or whatever it might be, right. um, a picture on the internet, what, what am I supposed to do about it? You know, or, be, or attributing that thing to something like the whole Pepe the Frog thing is now uh, is a racist meme. You know, and there's nothing that you can do about that. Right. It's like the most you can do is, and I've had to do this, is, is find the person, confront them, and if they don't want to take it down, tag them, and like everybody will go in, and like <laughs> yeah. everybody will just start on file on them, so yeah. they'll just take it down or delete their pages. I did, I, I did what you do. Right. They're not selling them or anything. Um, and with, with this, one of the things I've learned is promotion on social, on social media. So that's something I'm trying to figure out. Because one of the things I'm always, and I'm writing a book too, so that's coming, and I'm trying to figure out how much is too much? Like, I don't want to inundate people with like, oh my gosh, you're supposed to seven times in a day. But to also, converse of that is what you were saying earlier, that not everybody sees everything because of the way the algorithms are now. So if I post seven things in one day on saying to one subject, one person might see two of them. I mean, do you guys, how do you, do you guys, do you, I know you said you don't really use social media for promotion of your product, but I mean, do you guys use it? How do you use it? How much do you use well, it? Well, me personally, I have to pull back because every time I finish a page, I wanted to post it. And, right. I, and I was looking up and I was posting my whole book. Right. And before I pulled it out, the next page was going, they got to see it. And I had to stop, man. I had to do something to look, I had to like, I pace myself while I post it. Right. Like maybe do a page every couple of days. And maybe, definitely not the whole book, but at first I was literally doing the whole book. When I was kind of new to Instagram, I was, I was going to ask you about that. Everything. I was quite a person. Did you really read the whole book? Yeah. Do you all find yourself in the private Look, it, it, my, my motto, well, my, what I live by is I don't share unpublished, uh, unedited material, period. So if I'm working on something, nobody's seen. Um, that's just me, though. I know there are some authors who, that I, I get tagged in it quite a bit, the, the seven words, uh, the first seven words, or first seven sentences or lines of your book, and I'm like, no, uh, or your work in progress. I'm like, no, it's, it's a rough draft. I mean, I wouldn't even show, I, I wouldn't show my dog, and my dog can't even read. So, <laughs> um, it's gonna change and morph over the next couple of years, and there's no way you're looking at a work in progress. But uh, yeah, that's how I feel about that. <laughs> so. yeah, sometimes I will share that stuff. You know, it's it's Great. fun. I like to have fast feedback. Um, <laughs> and you know, yeah. if I change it, so what? You know, the number of people who are going to read it on Twitter or hear it in a reading as compared to the number of people who are actually going to get it in the book. You know, I I have I I, I read the prologue for Deep Roots at so many different readings, and I edited it at the last minute, and no one so far has come to me and said. But you changed what the alien was saying. Yeah, that, that's not what I'm scared of. I'm scared that there's like typos and all the kinds of grammatical errors and everything in, in there. Because that's what the interactive is part of the <laughs> That's what the idea is. 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 That's that unless you are a business like a Burger King or something like that, and you're specifically going there for that one thing, people are more apt to read your book or look you up if you are an entertaining person or you have other hobbies and associations. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants, and they definitely don't be the person that DMs the person as soon as they follow you and say, buy my book, right. and don't be that person. Or so, where's the person who DMs the person who didn't follow you? <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, is I just DM everybody in, in your feed. I was talking to you in 13 years. Exactly. I don't follow Brooklyn, I follow Bruce, but I follow Waterstones, right. who have the you know, they say awesome things about books. They they have a yes. interesting posts, and you know, if I ever am within a hundred miles of Waterstones, I'll probably go to Waterstones. <laughs> Well, one of the things that spawned the copyright issues and people using stuff like that, and this came up a lot when I was president of the scientific advanced guys in America. And I could give some recommendations if people are interested. I, I was, the, the main thing was how do you, I, I didn't know Number how to deal with one is put a copyright statement on your page. You're not going to stop people from yeah. copying, but if you have a statement, and you'll notice a lot of websites They'll say, this is our copyright policy to use my stuff. And you may decide to let people use it. You say, you, you have to put my name, and this is how you attribute it. And people are surprisingly, well, I shouldn't say surprised. <laughs> they are often to do what you ask. If you have a statement that says, you know, copyright notice as part of your website, it also protects you if ever legally you want to, if somebody actually takes your yeah. work and publishes it, either their artwork or they try to use a photograph of you which just happens at the same time, for their own financial gain, or they try to take the you writing the artwork. If you want to take the court, if you have that statement where you clearly stated the copyright, and you also have to be careful if they contact you and say, can I do this? Like I sometimes have people contact me and say, I want to use your characters, and essentially I want my fans to use yeah. your characters. I said, don't tell me. You know, if you, I have to say to you, my character is a copyright. Mm -hmm. If you don't tell me, you know, it's like you have to learn how to phrase it so you're basically saying, if you tell me, I have to tell you it's copyright. But, and like Tamora Purse has said she doesn't even go over real fan fiction. But fan fiction is, uh, it can be, there can be legalities with fan fiction, whether or not you're charging for that fan fiction. If you, if you are writing fan fiction and you are also an author who is using that fan fiction to sell their own books, like you've given away the fan fiction. The fan fiction is free, but if you were directing people from that fan fiction over to your own books, you still have a problem because you're making money off of that fan fiction just in a roundabout way. So fan fiction is a touchy subject. If people are interested, anybody has a question, so close to scientific answer. If you can join them, or if you can't join them, you don't get any credentials. They can refer you to people who can't help you. There's something called group call. And they will answer these questions. And there's also, if you're not a member, there's something called writer beware. Yeah, you can go to these websites, and they will give you advice. They will, sometimes, like one time, somebody was using a picture of me. I was upset. And they were using this picture from what they were saying, a picture of me. And we call money. Those are some things people can use. That <coughs> the writer beware is itself a really good example. Um, yeah. Early enough that I wonder if it should be called social media, but it really is it's social media being used to make sure people hear about bad actors in publishing. Yeah. So one of the things that it does is if you're looking for an agent, you can go in there and you can see who's a scammer, who is, is it this right. person who's asking yeah. me to pay a reading fee, have other people to pay with. Yes, yes, people have And Barbara, uh, Doris Strauss mm -hmm. does an excellent job. And my mentor was Ann Crispin that formed it with her. And that it, it's amazing what they try to do to help authors to keep them from being scammed. Whatever you do, any aspiring author in here, stay away from Publish America. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That is a whole. I want to thank everybody for um, enjoying the conversation. <coughs> You'll be able to catch these authors on more of our panel tomorrow, especially. And if you're interested in checking out any of their books, Barnes and Noble is upstairs selling the Peace Prize and um, and the book and. He is on the plaza of his, his table selling stuff, so I encourage you to go up there and buy some stuff. And even if you just want to stop by and talk.